Okay, everyone, um, thank you for attending this online research seminar hosted by the School of Journalism, Media and Culture at Cardiff University. Um, today's speaker is Professor Benjamin Arditi, who is a professor of uh, political theory in the National University of Mexico. Um, and uh, Ben is a, a really interesting thinker and writer and uh, today is essentially going to be presenting on the core ideas of his new book, which is um, raises some issues with with populism, as I understand it, as a, as a kind of um, well, I won't say because I don't know. I'm just guessing. But uh, Ben, would it be all right if I just handed straight over to you and um, and you can you can set us straight? Um, should I explain something or just go at it? Uh, I think, well, you've got 45 minutes. I think make best use of your time. That would be great. First of all, greetings to two friends that I haven't seen for a while, Jeremy Valentine and Emiliano Trere, who decided to jump ship from Mexico and go to Cardiff. It's a pleasure to see you, Emiliano. It's a pleasure to see you, Jeremy. Hola, Jaime. Gusto verte. Un placer. placer. Let's start with the let's start with the basic the first idea, which is an interesting quote from Lacan. Lacan, as you all know, he he coined the phrase that was quite problematic among feminists, which is "la femme n'existe pas," woman doesn't exist. And in I think it was seminar twenty two in the late sixties, um, he modified it slightly, and the line was "il n'y a pas la femme." There's no such thing as the woman. Now, of course, he was not talking about the absence of physical woman. He was talking about by using the, the, the definite article with a, a capitalizing it. What he was saying is that there's no such thing as the stereotypical woman, a generic woman. There are women in plural, but it's not a single woman. Uh, this idea was taken up in the mid 60s in a conference on populism at, Lo at the London School of Economics by um, Isaiah Berlin, who said that we have to avoid the Cinderella complex in working on populism. There's no such thing as a perfect foot that will fit a perfect, a perfect shoe. So the important thing is that both of them, Lacan and uh, Berlin, invite people that are going to do research to avoid universalizing, uh, in one case, women, in another case, populism. And if you look, if you make a quick search in Google, you will see that mm, they seem to have been success, been successful. There's no such thing as a single type of populism. If you key in populism, you get 64 million hits in Google. If you put populism in Latin America, you get 5.3 million. Populism in the US, 12 million. And populism in Europe, 17.7 million. If you do the same search, this is something I did about a month ago. So the, the, the numbers will change. If you look in Google Scholar and put the same, the same words, you put populism, you get 443,000 entries. That means 443,000 books, chapters, articles, conference presentations, drafts, commentaries, etc. If you put it in Latin America, it's 92,000, in the US, 194,000, and in Europe is 206,000. So uh, the problem of the Cinderella complex is obviously solved. Now, the production has been so great in the last half a century that people have had to organize the idea of populism around three waves. The first one, which they call classical populism, goes from the 1940s to the 1950s, and it's basically a Latin American experience with the exception, uh, depending on the author, with the exception of Gamal Abdel Nasser, uh, the colonel that overthrew the, the monarchy in Egypt in 54, 55. They're all characterized by being military men, they were interested in redistribution. They incorporate the underclass into politics. They were not particularly good at, um, at keeping inflation down and use the, the central bank to print bills in order to pay for social policy. 
Um, the second wave comes in the 1980s and 90s and is associated basically with, again, with three Latin American leaders. This time they're no, no longer military. In Argentina, it's Menem. In Brazil, it's Color de Melo. And in Peru, it's Fujimori. The main difference between this wave and the other is that this wave is very happy to follow the international, international monetary fund policies. And they're credited to having started the transition to neoliberalism in their own countries. What they keep from the first populism is the level, the the presence of the leader, personalism, and a demagogic approach to politics. The third way, which is a contemporary one, it's conventionally associated with the election of Hugo Chavez in Venezuela in 98. It includes the three leftist populists, according to the literature, which are Correa in Ecuador, Evo Morales in Bolivia, and Hugo Chavez. But it also includes uh, strong left and right wing people in Europe. For example, Syriza in Greece as a party and the, the left wing party Podemos in um, Spain, whose two founding leaders explicitly say that they owe their theory to reading Laclau and Mouffe hegemony and socialist strategy and having read Ernesto Laclaus on populist reason. But in Europe, you also have right-wing ones like Viktor Orban in Hungary, Matteo Salvini in Italy, Ma Marine Le Pen, Le Pen, the daughter of, um, of the elder Le Pen, and F Nigel Farage of Brexit fame. Other people that are included in this bunch are Netanyahu of Israel, Trump in the US, and Duterte, in uh, Philippines. Now, the problem with this third wave in particular is now that you have now you have populism for all kinds of taste. You have inclusive and exclusive ones, authoritarian and democratic, left wing and right wing, xenophobic or not xenophobic, racist or not, nativist or not. So the variety is so extraordinary that, to quote uh, Chairman Mao. Let a hundred flowers bloom, let a hundred schools of thought contend. It's a beautiful line that Mao didn't coin, but he took it from a Chinese poet. And the schools right now are, one of them it's called the ide ideational school that sees populism as a thin centered ideology. Um, Cas Mude, a commentator in The Guardian is one of the, the main exponents of the school. You have the strategic school, which is basically in the US, US political scientists that see populism just as a strategy to gain power and keep power, keeping power. You have the one that was popular, popularized by La Cloud, the discursive approach. There's dozens of other group that talks about populism as a performative. It's basically coming from a group of researchers in Australia. Benjamin Moffitt and others like that. And more recently, a book that came out this year that defines itself as a post like plowing a discursive approach, tries to blend the performative dimension, discursive dimension, but moving the debate on populism away from the ontological level that Laclau had posted into a more ontic one by adding sociological categories. Then there's another variety of uh, there's a diversity of other people that don't fit in with any of these schools. But you get the idea that there's a lot of polemic. Uh, people that see populism from a discursive approach have nothing to talk about with the ideational ones. The, the ideational ones, when they talk about the strategic ones, they say, this is naked a political realism, this is not populism. So there's not much of an agreement. Now, what is it that moved people to do research on, on this subject? Uh, obviously, because the word existed. But there's a line by one of the, most, the brightest thinkers of the 1960s on populism, Peter Worsley, who published uh, a <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, is that just me or have we lost him? Yeah, we've lost him at the moment. <clears throat> yes. Okay. Well, we'll give it a moment, hopefully. Hopefully you'll come back. Looks like quite a serious one. Uh, I think Benjamin's uh, disappeared. I think he's popped out for a bit. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll wait for him. Um, you might message me. I'll, t I'll tell him we'll wait for him. <laughs> now would be probably a good time to say to anybody, if as you're listening and you're thinking of any questions or comments um, on the talk, please do feel free to put them into the chat um, as we go along, uh, as we can use them as the basis for uh, starting off the discussion afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, he's been kicked out. I think he, I think he froze. I think something went wrong with the connection. So um, he's going to try and get back in. I shall keep an eye on that. Um, we'll just have... There he is. Okay, you're, you're on mute. You're back. So unmute yourself, please, Ben. Um, I don't know what happened. Um, I just got the, 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 the screen from the yeah, university. Yeah. And I had to reconnect. What I was saying is, I was reading a line by Worsley. Since a word, the word populism has been used, the existence of verbal smoke might well indicate a fire somewhere. And I think that for me, that line summarizes the, the invitation to do research on populism. It's the holy grail of populism. Everybody wants to find a fire. Um, so people say, I don't know if you saw a series called um, how I Met Your Mother, there was one line that was repeated all the time, challenge accepted. Barney said that. Now, challenge accepted is what everybody who read Worsley will... The problem is that I think that people misread Worsley, including me. I published two articles on populism. Hello. I think Hello. you're back now. I think you're back. I think it's just an unstable connection. It's an unstable um, connection. Yeah. So uh, people said challenge accepted, and everybody started to write about populism. And you had this fantastic production. As I was saying, I published two articles inspired by Worsley, but I think that everybody, including myself, misread Worsley, because what he said is, since the word has been used, the existence of verbal smoke might well indicate a fire somewhere. Now, he used a conditional might. Wow, this is a pity. I mean, what should what should we do in this situation? Just be patient. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah, I think that's all we uh, all we can do. Well, as you suggest, as you suggested, perhaps we can uh, exchange some thoughts on where we're at with these things. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, I, I find it overwhelming that we are just uh, surrounded by this sort of stuff uh, more and more, this strongman ideal, and uh, that it seems to be taking hold in, in portions of the population that astound me. The US, for example, on Trump is almost 50% of the population still believes in him. I, I don't get it. Amen. That's my contribution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we haven't really got. I mean, he's setting the scene at the minute, isn't he? We haven't really got to his argument or his 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 position on populism. Um, hopefully, he'll keep trying. Anyway, Jeremy, mm -hmm. 
How are yeah, you? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're on mute. How are you? I'm fine. Yeah. I'm yeah. Fine, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you're still in Edinburgh. How are you in Bristol? Oh yeah. Yeah. How personal can this conversation get? <laughs> Best not get very personal. We should probably stay quite, quite, <laughs> quite general. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Um... Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, good. Ben's trying to get back in. Um, here he comes. So, guys, I, I don't know what to say. My I have a strong signal. I just did the speed test and everything is working. So I don't know why it's so unstable. Yeah. Andy, Andy, what did you want to? Uh, did you want to say something? It's not ideal, Ben, but something that we could try is if you um, I mean, it, it, I don't know if it'll work, but if you turned your video off and just spoke to us and we all heard the audio, it might be worth a go. We haven't tried it yet. Mm -hmm. Let's go then. So if the might was misunderstood, that means that there's no guarantee that there will be a fire waiting behind the smoke. Now, my question is, after 50 years of research and very bright minds working on populism, are we any closer to having some minimal agreement of what the concept means, what we understand by populism? I'm not a Cartesian, so I'm not asking for clear and distinct things. I'm not talking about finding the essence of populism. I'm just saying, is there any kind of understanding that the average person has about what populism means? Now, one person that attempted to do this is Cas Mude, this Dutch researcher, He's one of the best known researchers on this. And he makes, he provides a minimal definition uh, that has three elements. You will identify populism whenever you see the good people against the evil elites. Second, whenever you have a division of political space into two camps. And third, whenever you find the centrality of a leader. Now, this is a very convenient definition. And if you look at Laclau's book, you will find something almost identical, but with different wording. Um, the, the, the leader as the empty signifier of unity, the space of antagonism split into two antagonistic camps, um, and the legitimate plebs that claims to represent the entire populace. So with different words, you have the same argument with Laclau. But I have a problem with, these, with the three points in this minimal definition. The first one is, can we just accept that elites are evil? Can't they be just bastards, really bad people? Just think about Donald Trump, Jeff, Be Jeff Bezos, or A Elon Musk. You're not talking about elites that are concerned with the good of the people. They're just concerned in making people and screwing whoever they want. In, in the case of Jeff Bezos is the, the appalling condition of workers who are hired for short-term periods and there's a high turnaround in Amazon, um, um, how do you call it, deposits or whatever. So elites can be evil and there's no problem about talking about the evilness of the people, of, uh, the, of the elites. The second thing is, if we're talking about a division of political space into two camps, doesn't that define every single radical politics? If you look at the manifesto, Marx and Engels said that there's a growing simplification of antagonism in society as the petty bourgeoisie is being pushed towards a proletarian by the expansion of large capitalist conglomerates and society is becoming more and more uh, a space of opposition between two big classes called the proletarian and the bourgeoisie. So there's a simplification of antagonisms. So should we, should we say that the class struggle is populism then? Or should we say that uh, the division of political space into two camps is rather characteristic of any kind of radical politics? And the third element, the centrality of the leader. If the centrality of the leader is what counts, shouldn't we also say that, say that Lenin, Mao, Fidel Castro are populists? Now, for some reason, I haven't seen this in the literature. So I get the impression that uh, populism doesn't apply to them. But you have the requisite, one of the three requisite conditions of a very, very strong leader, 
who is omnipresent. I should have should have added uh, Stalin as well, of course. And besides that, recent recent means twenty years ago. Recent research on political re representation. I'm thinking about the work of Bernard Manan, a French theorist who's widely read in in the U.S. at least. He developed a uh, an explanation about what's happening with representation after he heard people saying representation is not what it used to be. We used to be interested in programs, ideas, debates, but now everybody goes with sound bites. So there is a decadence of representation. And what he says is, no, there is no decadence. What we have is a metamorphosis of representation. So he traces representation from early, 20, early 19th century to the present and starts with the English parliamentarian system that was not democratic. Then he starts, then he goes on with what he calls party democracy with the expansion of suffrage until he gets to something he calls audience democracy that defines the present. And one of the key characteristics of, of audience democracy is that we live in societies that change so quickly because of interconnected nations. The complexity of decisions is so wide that voters basically choose as their leaders or as their representatives, people who they trust will be able to face the unexpected. The way that Manan explains this is that there is some kind of recuperation of something that Locke said in the second treatise of government, which is prerogative power. He says, you have to think of, you have to remember that Locke is the, 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 the father of of the of the legal state of uh, uh, the rule of law under liberalism, etc. But he was not a fool, so he understood he understood pre perfectly well that sometimes you have to make decisions without a standing rule to be able to justify the decision. He called that prerogative power, and he defined prerogative power as making decisions in the absence of a standing rule. He also says that. Initially, governments were mostly prerogative power, and the margin of prerogative power has been closing down. But according to Manan, we can use prerogative power to explain the increasing person personalization of political choices. So the idea of institutions making decisions that was part of the liberal imaginary of the early 20th century, according to Manan, no longer works. You have the level, the, the role of the leader has become much more central than ever before. Now, Manan is not talking about populism. He's talking about your standard liberal democratic representative system. So my, my conclusion of this is that after reading something like Moody's minimal definition of populism is that it's highly simplistic to start shouting populism whenever we're, we are prompted by the dog whistles of strong leaders, good people, evil elites, and so on and so forth. So my proposal is quite simple. Why not try something different? What have we done so far? The usual premise is that there is something called populism and that we should try to figure out what it means. So let's do the research to get the publication. I want to change that premise and use a variation of that, um, that quotation I did with, about Lacan. I said, il n'y a pas la femme. There is no such thing as, as the woman. We can replace that with il n'y a pas le populisme. There's no such thing as populism. Or we can go for something uh, which would be a bit lighter, which would be a nod to Lacan, but an adaptation and say, is there such a thing as populism? So if you rephrase the question in those terms, you leave the door open for the possibility that the certainty of the phenomenon is less uncertain. So in that way, you convey some kind of undecidability concerning whether populism is a relevant object of thought or if it is one of these unicorns of the social sciences that you pursue, 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 but never come to find what it is. So I like this, is there such thing as populism? Because 
the is there puts a condition, puts populism as a conditional and not as a given. If we accept this premise, instead of looking for something called populism, questioning if there is or there isn't something called populism, then I can see two possible options. The first one is with the one I've, I would like to, to propose, but I'll, is that populism has passed this use by date and we can just dump the concept. Now, it would sound presumptuous, particularly since there's so many careers that have been made through populism. There's so much funding for conferences and research from the funding authorities in the US, probably in the UK, definitely here in Mexico. So uh, people wouldn't like abandoning it. And it's also, who am I? A professor from a Mexican university proposing, let's get rid of populism. Um, here I take my inspiration from other people that have done outrageous things like that. Uh, and I would like to read a quote from quite a famous sociologist. Uh, I don't know if you, if you guys read anything of sociology, but I'm thinking of Alain Touraine. Alain Touraine, you cannot dismiss him uh, because he's one of the three theorists that rewrote the, the book about what it means to study social movements in the 1970s and 80s. Um, Turem wrote, on, wrote a book called The Voice and the Eye, and within that there was a section called The Useless Idea of Society, and he says, and let me quote you, quote him, the concept of society can be completely disregarded in sociological analysis. It's very strong, and it's very strong coming from a sociologist, and if anybody has ever taken an introductory course to uh, to sociology, you will hear probably in the first couple of weeks that the object of sociology is the study of society. Now, this is a, an accomplished sociologist, he's still alive, but barely, uh, who proposes, let's get rid of it. And look what he says. I go on with a quote. Society is no longer an essence, but an event, an ever-changing combination of latent or manifest conflicts, of negotiations, of imposed domination, and of violence. At least sociology, sorry, at last sociology can completely do away with the concept of society. A biologist, Francois Jacob, has written that modern biology originated when biologists stopped asking questions about life and started studying living beings. Similarly, sociology really begins when sociologists reject society as a concept and devote themselves entirely to the study of social relations. I therefore propose that the concept of society be completely discard, disregarded in sociological analysis, and that this term be used solely to describe specific historical entities, such as the American society or even the industrial society." End of quote. Now, uh, you, you heard what I said, It's what, what I read. It, this guy 40 years ago, he proposed, a sociologist proposed, let's get rid of the Council of Society. Three years after Duren published his book, Ernesto Laclau published a short, intriguing article called The Impossibility of Society. Now, he was not saying abandon the Council of Society, but he told us to consider the possibility that society as a, as a clearly identified and identifiable uh, object of thought should be displaced by the distinction between society and the social. And all what you will have now will be failed attempts to institute the impossible object called society. So you have two accomplished theorists. One, I, uh, I don't know where to position Laclau, um, post-Marxism. Uh, Laclau, on the one hand, a sociologist like Turin, 40 years ago, they told us, let's get rid of society as we as we knew it. So I think that if I ask to think that populism passes use by date, um, I'm not asking for something completely outrageous. Now, on the other hand, 40 years after these guys wrote what they wrote, we still talk about society. So the success, the, the, the criticism doesn't guarantee the success of the change of the, our vocabulary. But then again, um, 
we're highly rational people with PhDs, uh, but we still read the horoscope, even to laugh about it. And most of us spend some time thinking about the what we read inside a fortune cookie. On the other hand, there's more radical, uh, mm, strange thinking like the Flat Earth Society in the US that has yearly conferences. So my first, my first proposal after the premise of is there such thing as populism is to consider the possibility that populism can be eliminated as a concept. The second possibility is that I understand that, again, the career making concept will find a lot of resistances about dumping it. So we could say that populism, populism is still a valid object of thought, but we need a different way of thinking about it. I tried to propose this, the second option, simply because I know that 99% of the people that do research on populism will just ignore what I say. Personally, I prefer option one, dumb populism. But I understand also those who want to go on uh, working on populism. And that's why I propose seven and a half provocations. Seven and a half provocations that I understand as a methodological guideline of do, for how to do political research, in this case, applied to populism. My plan A is propositions, uh, provocations one and two. My plan B is provocations three to seven, uh, that which are basically addressed to those who, who still want to study populism. So which would be the first one? The first one is the second. I'm not talking about populism, but use it only as an insult. Use it in order to disqualify people, policies, or parties you don't like. In this case, you would have to think in terms of populism as an accusation. You accuse people of being populists. You denounce people as populists. Or what we could say as an alternative to this, sorry, as a supplement to this, is that we give populism exactly, exactly the same status that democracy had in ancient Greece in the 19th century Britain. Let me read something that Jacques Rancière said in The Hatred of Democracy. He said, in ancient Greece, democracy was a word used as an insult by those who saw in the unnameable government of the multitude, the ruin of any legitimate order. It remained synonymous with abomination for everyone who thought that power fell by right to those whose birth had predestined them to it or whose cap capabilities called them to it. So basically what he's saying is that for the Greeks, if you found somebody in the street who said whatever he, let's say you found a Tory, you would say just, you would shout at, what well, doesn't work with the Tory, you will find something from labor and just shout at him or her, you Democrat. In that way, you were just saying you're nobody, you're nothing. Now, C.B. McPherson, this brilliant and little red Canadian political theorist said something different. He's talking about Britain in the 19th century. And he says, democracy used to be a bad word. Everybody that was someone knew that democracy in its original sense of rule by the people or government in accordance with the will of the bulk of the people would be a bad thing fatal to individual freedom and to all the graces of civilized being, living, sorry. And if you don't trust Macpherson, I have a beautiful quote from one of Queen Victoria's prime minister, Benjamin Disraeli. Let me quote him. This was, he said this shortly before parliament approved the second um, electoral act, I think it was called reform act in 1867. He said, and I quote, we do not live, and I trust it will never be the fate of this country to live under a democracy. So my first provocation then is so simple. If you still want to talk about populism, keep it as an insult, as an accusation, as a denunciation, just like democracy used to be. My only preoccupation when I say this is that in the past, 10, 15 years, there has been, at least for me, an unexpected revival of Cold War rhetoric where the words of accusation are leftist, progressive, 
socialist and communist. I'm thinking particularly about what, what has happened in countries that had either progressive leaders or something that is not a reactionary leader. Not reactionary, but not progressive is Joe Biden in the US. When they, when during the debate about the approval of the new budget and the infrastructure investment, his policies were accused of being socialist, Marxist inspired, because America is about freedom and nobody should force us to pay for all these, this infrastructure and nobody should force us to get vaccinated. In Mexico, the same thing is happening with the election of somebody who's not from the left, but he's not from the right either, um, who started a, an increase of minimum wage, transfer of resources to the poor, and he's being accused as turning Mexico into a communist republic and stoking the class struggle. So when I say that populism could be kept as a word of insult, equivalent to democracy in the past, I have the ambivalence about it just because I'm seeing communism, um, communism and leftist have a revival. Now, my second provocation is, if you don't want to use populism as an accusation, then why don't we just say that populism is something that happened in the mid 20th century, basically in Latin America, the epitome of populism was Peronism in Argentina, and whatever came later was something else. We kept on using the word because we found family resemblances between what happened with Peron and what happened in the 1980s and now in the past 20, 25 years, but that's a mistake. Why is it a mistake? I already mentioned three waves of populism. The, the first wave was redistributive and inclusionary. The second wave was neoliberal. And the third one, you find inclusionary, exclusionary, nativist, non-nativist, and so on and so forth. So the specificity of the concept seems to be evaporating. So why do we just accept populism happened is something of historical interest, and now we have to move on and find different names for the rest of the things. My third provocation, if I can find my notes, is, okay, maybe populism is okay, but formalism isn't. And by formalism, I mean Ernesto Laclau, which I find one of the least useful theories of populism. Let me read some quotes about uh, from, from Laclau. These are quotes, I'm combining two sources. One hey, is- ben, we're, we're thinking maybe five more minutes, is that okay? Yeah, I don't think I need more. Okay, cool. Um, the first one is that Laclau proposes that there's no difference between populism and politics. And let me quote from a, for two quote, one quote from an article. If populism consists in postulating a radical alternative within the communitarian space, a choice in the crossroads on which the future of a given society hinges, does not populism become synonymous with politics? The answer can, be, can only be affirmative. Second quote, this time from Unpopulist Reason. There is no political intervention which is not populistic to some extent. And my last quote from uh, regarding the equivalence of populism politics is, Populist Reason, insofar as it is the very logic of a construction of the people, amounts to political reason tout court. Now, what we get here is the effort of one of the best known theories of populism that presents populism as equivalent to politics, in which case I would make a choice. Either we go on talking of populism as if we were talking about politics or simply drop populism and go on talking about populism. You don't need two words for the same phenomenon. The second problem, and this is the one I address more specifically, is a problem of formalism. Two quotes from Laclau. A movement is not populist because in its politics, politics or ideology, it presents actual contexts that are identifiable as, popul identifiable as populist, but because it shows a particular logic articulation of those contents, whatever those contents are, whatever those contents are, it doesn't 
care about the contents. Second, a movement is not populistic because in its politics or, ide or ideology, it presents actual contents identifiable as populistic, but because it shows a particular logic of articulation of those contents, whatever those contents are. So he repeats, oops, oh, shit. no, I repeated the quote. I forgot to put the second quote. Anyway, it's basically the same thing. It's form rather than content. Now I can understand that Laclau is part of a generation that has read, uh, has read Saussure, but after it went through the filter of Jacobson, La Jacobson, Lacan, and so many other people, where the primacy is given to the signifier or the plane of, plane of expression rather than the plane of content. But by saying that populism is strictly a mode of articulation, regardless of the content, he has thrown the baby together with the bathwater because there's no way for him to be able to distinguish two kinds of things. First, a distinction between populistic and non-populistic discourses. As long as there is a chain of equivalence articulated around an empty signifier of the leader, there will be populism. The one that studied this very well was a disciple of Laclau called Yanis Tavrakakis, who tries to rescue and defend Laclau's theory but in his study about the discourse of the Greek Orthodox Church, he realizes that the, the discourse of the church, sorry, I have to turn this off. Um, where was I? Yanis Stavrakakis and- um, Stavrakakis. Yeah. He says there's absolutely no way of establishing the distinction between two chains of equivalence that are radically different. And the second problem that the purely formalistic approach has is that you have no possibility of making normative choices. You cannot make a decision why you should support Brexit or somebody like Nigel Farage or support somebody like Hugo Chavez, at least not from within his theory. Now, Stavrakakis doesn't mention the second point. He's only interested in distinguishing between populist and non-populist uh, chains of equivalence. So the way that he wants to solve it is, he says explicitly, perhaps we have to go beyond mere articulation by introduction, affect, intensity, and that kind of thing. Now, that's a remarkable thing to say for somebody from coming from somebody who wants to defend discourse theory because what he's actually proposing is that we cancel out the basic assumption of, of, of Laclau and supplement it with something external to Laclau. He doesn't say how he will do it, and I have serious problems in how to measure the intensity of an intensity, how much you can hate somebody or love somebody are impossible to, uh, to measure. Now, Chantal Bouffe, the wife of Laclau, recently said that the only way of distinguishing two types of populisms is introducing uh, leftist values. Now, that is a hat trick because in order to do that, you have to modify the initial theory that you're defending, which is that all that counts is the mode of articulation rather than the contents being articulated. I'm not going to go into more details because the time is over. I'll just mention the names of the other provocations. Provocation three and a half, and I only call it as a half provocation because I don't propose ways of building it in. It's four ways of thinking of not for about normative criteria to dif differentiate um, different, different discourses. The fourth provocation is it's not, you need to introduce the notion of context in order to discuss if the elites are actually evil and the people are actually good. It might be that you're confused and the people happen to be in the wrong. For example, those who voted for Hitler in 1933 or those who voted for Bolsonaro in Brazil in 2018 or Trump or whoever. So context would be necessary to disambiguate a concept. The fifth, the fifth one is that context is not enough because the same context can engender the same two different phenomena. So we're here I propose something that Jeremy and I propose in the book, which is the practice of polemicization. 
And it's basically what Rancière proposes in this agreement. You have to subject uh, the concept of the experience to the protocols of a disagreement or of polemicizing the commonplace. The sixth one is that polemics is not enough either. You need to, if you want to think about the goodness of the people and the evilness of the elites, you need the situated gaze of the observer. It's different if you see the world from the point of view of those who have nothing to survive to reach the end of the month, or you think it in terms of those who will benefit by the reduction of taxes to the rich as Trump did in 2017. And the seventh and last one is, I just mentioned it, is taking one brilliant line of one of the last pieces that Foucault published before, before dying, which is an article called The Subject and Power, when he says that power relations are increasingly governmentalized. And by governing, governing he's, he, uh, his definition is to structure the possible field of action of others. Now, that is the idea that defines the concept of police and Rancière. I want to modify Rancière's argument by saying that he misread Foucault. Rancière in, a, in an interview said that of all the contemporaries that he admired, the one that comes closer to his work is Foucault. He excludes Derrida, Deleuze, and all of those. But I think that Rancière is taking the concept of structuring the, structuring the possible field of action of others in a very restrictive sense, because Foucault never said that that's what the existing order uh, means, i.e. Governing, governing for Foucault was not the executive power. So you can talk about a subaltern way of governing, which is governing from below. Everybody wants to structure the possible field of action of others. And if that is the case, uh, the argument's a bit more complicated because I have to introduce relations of strategy afterwards. If that is the case, the assumption of most of populist theories, including Laclau, doesn't work in terms of the um, clear line separating the us and them, them. Because instead of having a splitting of the political field, you have multiple and simultaneous struggles happening asynchronically in different places, different levels, and not often coordinated with one another. And that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, you're going to try a camera again now. Okay. <laughs> if it worked, it doesn't seem to interrupt the, the conversation. So yeah, the um, the audio was good then. We're sorry you had to turn your camera off. Um, there, I don't think there've been any any comments in the um, in the chat. But can I just I'll pose one quick question and then and then limit myself to one. Um, it strikes me that the the problem. Uh, no, I want clarity on whether there's two problems. On the one hand, you, you're arguing that the concept of populism is academically obsolete now, um, <clears throat> or that's what your sense is, that it doesn't have a specificity that would make it useful, and you kind of think that academics should really abandon it. Um, but in terms of like wider cultural political discourse, is the concept problematic in the sense that it limits our thinking, or is the pro is the concept problematic in that it stops us from seeing or thinking in the right way about things, or do you just not like it because you can't limit it, uh, give it a kind of a specific flavor to distinguish it from? So you don't want to collapse it into the meaning of politics. You know, Laclau argues all politics is populism essentially in that book, um, and you don't want to do that. But is that is it a problem for political discourse itself if we organize ourselves around the notion of populism, or is it just a kind of rubbish concept? When I discuss with some colleagues of mine, uh, some of them have said, "Look, populism is what populists themselves say that they do." I think that's bullshit. I've never heard a political operative saying, oh, hi, I'm a populist. Can I, can I shake your hand? Populism is something like talking about the lumpen, lumpen proletariat or the bourgeoisie. The bourgeois called themselves bourgeois just because they were city dwellers, but they never thought that uh, we're the owners of the means of production, so that means that we have a class consciousness. And 
they just did what they did. And the proletarians that went to went into a struggle, they didn't do it because they had read the manifesto. They went because they were pissed off with how things, with, with how society was treating them. If you look more recently, um, the, the, the Occupy Wall Street or Tahrir Square, all these people, do you think that they read a book about what to do before they went and did it? They didn't even have a, a plan of action. They just said, let's do something. Let's say enough. Now, one person that theorized that very well is Rancière in that book that you edited, Paul, about 10 years ago, when he says, revolutionaries everywhere invented a people before they invented their future. What he's saying, and it took me a while to understand that line, what he was saying basically is that you don't need to have a plan of action or a program or a manifesto to do something. You start doing it and the manifesto, the concrete proposals start appearing afterwards. There's a US researcher that has some a, a similar approach saying, a beautiful name for her book, it's called, she's called Marina Citrin. She studies the Occupy movement. She says, she named her book Goals Without Demands, saying that what moved the Occupy movement was having general goals, democracy, justice, redistribution, but no concrete demands, which I imagine that for the followers of Laclau must be quite painful given that he defined social demand as the minimum unit of analysis of populism and politics. So either he's wrong or the Occupy movement is not political. So when I'm asking to get rid, to drop the concept of populism, I'm not saying that it's simply a problem of academics because it is us academics that invented the word to define an experience in the first place. Peron, when he was ruling, he never thought, oh, what I'm doing sounds different. What could it be? What could it be? Oh, I'm a populist. No, the first one to say that was Gino Germani an Italian sociologist that went to live in Argentina and wrote the first research that used the word populism to define the experience of Perón. Of course, there's the equivalent of Neanderthal populism, which is, you will always find the agrarian populism in Russian 19th century, the populist party, well, the popular party in the US at the turn of the uh, 19th to 20th century, William Jennings Bryant in the US or Huey Long. But these are like the hominids, Neanderthals of the theory of, of populism. So my point is that it's not a problem of academics having missed the meaning of a concept, but that the experience with, that we want to capture with the name of populism is something that occurred in a short period of time of 20 years. It's no longer current. That's what I would say. Uh, there's disagreement, of course. Okay, thank you very much. So I know that Jeremy Valentine has a question. And if anyone else thinks of a question, if you just put your hand up with the, um, you know, the reactions thing. But Jeremy, if, if you want to unmute yourself and um, you can. Pose yeah. yeah, got you now. Uh, <laughs> it's a more series of random comments and question, but um, I think what well, I actually was going to say kind of comes back to what you ended up talking about just then and really there's a um what's what sort of got confused but on the left not on the right uh was the was you know a crude theoretical practical distinction um and of course on the left there's this dream that you can abolish um that, that distinction through a philosophy of praxis or something like that. Um, but that, I mean, you know, the, 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 the left populism in, uh, in Greece, in Spain, even in Corbyn, in the Labour Party, were saying, yeah, we're populists, but we're populists of the left. And this was, you know, it's probably confined to a uh, 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 a small number of people, but but the term was mobilized in in that sense. We can have a left uh, uh, populism, and um, <clears throat> and they probably all read um, Le Clown Mouth at Oxbridge or wherever they got their uh, degrees from. So 
I, I, like you, I can't really say anything about the practical level. Things happen, and then journalists and academics try and um, uh, make sense of it and put a, a category on it. Although these phenomena that got referred to as populism happened in quite a, a, a spectacular way and be in an unexpected way. I, I remember a, a few years ago, about 2017, I was at a UK Political Studies Association conference, and there was this massive session, uh, all the big hitters were there, on explaining Brexit, because for UK political science, Brexit isn't something that should have happened. So, you know, they're all... Uh, um, uh, and they were showing, you know, scattered diagrams of where spec Brexit supporters were and, and every, everything like this, i.e. their political science was not only the theoretical norm, but as they imagined it, the practical norm. So there is something about how that theoretical practical distinction does kind of get blurred sometimes. I don't think it's particularly important. What in this case seems more important is the unexpected and spectacular nature of um, uh, 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 these phenomena that we, that we refer to as uh, populist. And it seems to me, just looking at the stats, that in most spaces where uh, populism emerges, the statistical division of society is 49-51, i.e. It, it's not a majority, it's a, big, it's a big enough majority within a roughly liberal democratic um, electoral systems. Putin is, is the exception to that because uh, if you don't vote for Putin in Russia, you lose your job because you have to, when you vote, uh, take a photo of your ballot paper to show that you voted for Putin and then you have to show that to your boss um, and if you don't do that you're you're in trouble that's not to deny the um, popularity of, of Putin in Russia so but going back to the theoretical and analytical label I, I think that it really is more a question and I have a sympathy to one half of, of Leclerc and Moog on this, the kind of like the theoretical half in Leclerc, the political half is a bit useless really, but the, 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 the theoretical half, and it, it was prompted really, it, that, that it is a question of, a situ of an overdetermined situation, defined, you know, characterized by antagonism in the deep ontolog ontological sense that Leclerc um, uh, argues for in, in his better uh, uh, ideas. But that is something that, of course, it's something that, you know, people like us only talk about the day after. Um, uh, uh, there isn't like an algorithm, there may be, but I doubt it, that there's an algorithm that will uh, predict it, although I expect they're working on it. And it seems to me that that is uh, a, a moment where, you know, as a kind of find it, it's where, you know, everything comes into question, not necessarily for you and me, but for certain uh, uh, section of, of uh, a population, everything comes into question. And it, the answer to that question has been uh, uh, defined, in, defined in terms of we are the people and the people has these characteristics. And what and the demand of the people is for sovereignty, power over. Lefty kind of libertarians like me aren't really interested in sovereignty. And we know, we know the rules of the game of governmentality so we can work our way around them and you know, know how to answer the forms and get away with it and, and, and stuff like that. But there does remain that, um, uh, uh, um, uh, that real actual um, uh, phenomenon taking, taking place. So the political questions do come down to, um, or, or the big political questions, capital P political questions, do come down to, it's the Gramscian problematic as well, is that how that crisis, as you were, or organic crisis, or 
or what you want to call it, is decided and settled. And I think on the left and on the liberal left and even on the liberal capitalists uh, didn't see that coming, didn't see that that would be the consequences of their own actions, under which it seems to me, people are governed too much and they're, they're fed up of it and they see constant governing, they don't see sovereignty. So they don't, in a sense, there's no one there to blame. Okay, like so, said, it's just an observation. so that's yeah, quite a long observation, but that's really good observation. So I guess Ben has to choose which aspects of that he wants to respond to. Do you want to, mm -hmm. do you want to respond to that, Ben? Should I ramble back? Yeah. Um, uh, you could do some kind of forensic okay. strike, some tactical strikes there. No, I mean, just pick up the, pick up the many, what, some of the many bits of that that you want to respond to, because that's, that's a lot of stuff there. I don't know where was the, if there was a question. I can understand his conclusion that people are fed up of being governed and that's basically what they want, but I don't know how that fits into populism. Um, can I give you another example? I, I talk about the useless of uh, the concept of, of populism, the uselessness. Uh, there's another one called left turns. Do you know, it was a big industry writing about the left turns and guess what? I wrote about it myself, but I started with a question. Everybody agrees that there has been a left turn in a few countries of Latin America, but everybody agrees with two other things. One, after the fall of the wall, who knows what the left means anymore? And two, what is precisely that makes a, a, some, a turn leftist or not? So you have two kind of uh, it's a, there's a performative contradiction between saying there has been a left turn, but we don't know what left turns me, uh, left, the left means anymore. You cannot hold the two, uh, the two statements simultaneously with one of them being invalid, not being invalid. The same thing happens with populism. We get incredible improvements in the, in the theory, incredible field work, but the basic thing is that we're looking for a unicorn. It's a concept that can fit anything inside it right now. So for me, a concept that's so unlimited stops being valid as a, as a concept to think political realities. I want to have the freedom to talk about elites splitting the political field, strong leaders without having to uh, connect it to populism because it's not always connected to populism. I think Andy Williams is- yeah, Andy, yeah. There was also a question from Emilia wandering the streets of dark Helsinki. She might want to go before me. She did raise that before. Are you there, Emilia? No. Mine wasn't much of a question, Ben. It was more uh, an appeal for you to tell us a little bit more about the situated gaze of the observer, because it sounded fascinating and I want to hear more of your thoughts around that. Um, and I guess part of my reason for wanting to hear more about that is because it sounds like it might help us in the UK understand what happened with the Brexit vote and how that's been understood by our political observers and journalistic class. You have at least three sources for this. One, you can take Marx and, and say that um, it's social being that determines social consciousness. Uh, which is an argument that has, and that means that your place of enunciation will help you see the world in a different way. One of the problems with that argument is uh, brilliantly dismissed by Paul Hurst about 40 years ago when he said, yes, it's true. Social consciousness determines, sorry, um, social being determines social uh, your consciousness. But how would we know? only if we have a specific form of consciousness called historical materialism that tells you that social being determines social consciousness. So he identifies a circularity or even a tautology in the reasoning of Marx. His way out is to say, Marxism is not a scientific theory. Marxism is a theory of political calculation. I buy that for the time being at least, but what, is not invalidated is that the place from where you see the world will have some kind of bearing on how you act. 
the place of enunciation with the limitations that the same place of enunciation can produce a sexist and a feminist, a racist and a non-racist. Workers can be completely racist and nativists, and workers can be the most generous people on earth. But at least the general idea of Marx at your place of enunciation, of enunciation um, perhaps not determines, but structures your seeing of the world. The second source of Nietzsche is Nietzsche, who said that there's only a perspective. There is no possibility of an Archimedean point of view. You cannot reach totality because you only always see the world from a situation. And the third one is something that it's a source that is not available in English, which is a collection of conferences that Michel Foucault gave in 1973 to a group of psychoanalysts in, Sao, in Rio de Janeiro. And in one of them, he explains in the clearest possible way the influence of Nietzsche on his work at the time. We're talking about the early 70s, just about the time when he was starting, the, we, he, has, he was working already in um, uh, the birth of the prison. So if you take all these things, it, you can start thinking that your appreciation or your negation of populism is at least partly determined by the place from where you're speaking about populism. I'm thinking about Mexico, uh, the current president won by 53% of the votes. The addition, if you add up all the other parties, uh, they got something like 45%, and the 8% the difference is uh, abstentions or, uh, or nullified votes. Who are the ones that lost? They're the people that were used, the elites that were used to govern and felt entitled because they were whiter than the average population, they were richer than the average population. So they thought that it was innate for them to rule. And they have organized a vehement, strong opposition that is completely useless. It's an opposition that exists in the media, but you can see that the presence of the current president liberated this racism and classism that was kept, I wouldn't say dormant, but with some kind of makeup to dissimulate its, um, its excesses. In the same way that the election of Trump did not make you, that did not make part of the US population racist. It was already racist. It just felt that it could come out of the closet with its racism. Uh, it was emancipated by, by Trump. So when they talk about the place of enunciation, it's, or the perspective, the gaze, is to remind the readers that the use of populism as a positive or as a negative category has nothing to do with the conceptual value of the concept, but by the political position or existential position or whatever place of enunciation you want to, to think of. Okay, cool. Um, uh, did Amelia, Amelia, do you want to speak? I know Amelia might be. Yeah, she is. I made it home. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone. Uh, thanks so much, Ben. It's uh, great to uh, at least hear you, since I didn't really see you, and uh, neither did that, the others, so I didn't miss, miss anything in this. But but I was just wondering. The first part of your talk was uh, quite. Um, I mean, it's really hard to shake it from us, right? From uh, Essex, but it was very similar to this imminent reading of. Ernesto's work that I do. I mean, there are several, I would think that there are several imminent readings of Ernesto's work, but it's, it's quite similar to mine. But then you end up on this uh, track of like, that of course we didn't uh, get in full because we didn't have time to explain it all. But, but in, in that uh, sort of, um, like before you said that populism is something uh, it gives you a possibility to think with, and then you said that it's not about this for aw awful formalism that Laclau was uh, uh, insisting on. And um, you probably know that I'm like the proto-formalist Laclau Laclaudian, and uh, my argument is that it's pure uh, form, it's not content. But it's interesting, um, 
that you have this like it should be something that we think with at the same time as there would be this uh, rejection of formalism. Uh, so I'm I'm sort of puzzled of what have what is left because you then say that you want to talk about these uh, phenomena, uh, these uh, things that are usually associated as the contents of populism, uh, as pertinent for kind of politics. So is it form or content uh, after all? And I, I've been I've been doing this uh, recently in in my talks that I've been trying to talk about like look at several uh, groups of people working on populism and are like trying to find out whether they are uh, talking about it from the perspective of content or from the perspective of form. And tomorrow I'm uh, going to be having a talk with Maria Esperanza Casuyo and uh, uh, Yanis Stavrakakis. And uh, I think that the perspective of Yanis is actually on the content of populism rather than uh, the, the form of populism, because he's insisting on that people and on that left wing people. So it's actually kind of a version of peopleism. So uh, how do you sort of, what would you answer to this question, <laughs> like from your perspective of how we should think or not think about populism? Thank you. I really like your talk. And yes. sorry about being kind of out of <laughs> the, zero degrees. You're just a sweet talker. Um, look, I don't know what Stavrakakis is, Stavrakakis is thinking right now. I read a few articles of his and I was struck by the fact that he wants to defend uh, the formalist theory of Ernesto and at the same time realizes that there is a problem with it. And he tries to solve it by intru introducing the intense of the affective engagement. That's fine, he can do that. But the problem is that it's, for me, it's something similar to talking about the left term saying that we don't know what the left means. Now, you cannot defend a theory like Ernesto's that is in 100% independent from content and then add a content and pretend that nothing happens to the theory. You have to find a way of introducing it and to making the theory work because either everything is discourse and there's, uh, let me give you something that I, I agree. I agree with you on this point. It, it, one little thing is that what Judith Butler said about Ernesto, Ernesto says, well, there's no outside of discourse. And that's the difference between Foucault and, and Chantal and me. But on the other hand, he keeps on using empirical examples to validate his theory. And for me, that's a classical epistemology. Does it fit with reality or not? And if you say that his theory has a better fit with reality, you have already thrown away your discourse theory of the world. That's one thing. The second thing is that I was careful not to say that there should be some populist content. What I said is that a formalist theory of populism is useless for making political decisions and political choices. Laclau made a clear political choice for left wing, what he calls left wing populism. And that's fine. I applaud that and I, will, I would give him a hug if he was a, a, alive and sober. But his problem in this, the problem here is that you cannot replace it. It's not a matter of replacing it with certain contents. I said that you should consider context, polemics, the situated gaze, normative criteria, and uh, strategic relations. I didn't say content, and I don't think we should put uh, content. Um, what I think about Laclau is that he's part of a generation of people that grew up with a critique of the first, the first wave of semiotic studies of the 1950s. You have to think that media studies is fairly, uh, fairly new. It's over half, it's 70 years old. But who were the first media, the people that worked on media? Roland Barthes writing mythologies. Mythologies is a very pedestrian priority of content over form. And with the assumption that there is one plane of expression called the language object that is capable of conveying the world exactly as it is. And there's another semiological system that distorts the reality of the world. Now, we've come a long way since then. 
and you have uh, Lacan's inversion of the primacy of the signifier, uh, instead of the primacy of the signified over the signifier, as in Saussure, you have Lacan putting the signifier on top of the signified. Then you have Marshall McLuhan when he talks about the, me the medium as a message. If you say the medium as a message is because you're reacting to the early Frankfurt School, trying to think about the contest being transmitted by TV. And I love McLuhan, but there's a problem that yeah, there's a metaphor that Althusser used to use, which is in order to straighten a walking stick, you have to bend the wood in the opposite direction, in which case you run two risks. One is that you don't bend it enough, and the second is that you bend it too much. And in the case of McLuhan and people that have followed him, I think they bend too much the idea that the medium is a message, not because the idea is wrong, but by saying the medium is a message, they lost, or many of the ones I know that work within that kind of paradigm, they lost concern about anything that was not the plane of expression. When you say that the medium is a message, you're deciding that there's a priority of form over content. Laclau is part of that tradition. And just like McLuhan, if, if I can give you an example, uh, Goebbels, the, the propaganda minister of uh, Hitler, he understood perfectly well that the medium was a message, but he used it to transmit a particular type of content. We are the chosen people, we're going to rule the world. So at least if we're going to, if we're going to study a phenomenon that you want to call populism, if such a word, such an experience exists, you have to go beyond pure, pure form. If you stick to the form, you can produce a brilliant, beautiful uh, conceptual choreography, which is something that people like Laclau love to do, but you won't be able to explain why people make political choices. Most of the times people make political choices because their friends tell them, because they read it in, the, in, the, in the, their social media, or simply because there was a whim and said, okay, I'll vote for this person. I accept that. But Laclau is not proposing that you choose by flipping a coin who you were, you're going to vote for, but he says that there's a way of committing yourself to a politics of change. If there is a way to commit to a politics of change, you have to go beyond pure form. It's as simple as that. Okay, it's as simple as that. That's the best way to... Um... Wait, wait. Yep. Emilia, you have to send wait, wait, wait. <laughs> the imminent reading of Laclau. You have to send me an article. If you can send it via email. Uh, there's one in uh, Thesis 11. That's uh, just uh, one version of that. But we should continue yeah. this. Thanks so much for organizing it. And should I assume that it's not in Finnish? No, no. no. In Thesis 11, you would find uh, from earlier this year, this democracy versus demography. That's part of that reading. Okay, well, we've, we do have to be quite strict with the, the times and we've, we've gone on a few minutes longer, but um, I, I'm going to thank you, Ben, and I'm going to call a, a, a pause to the, um, the discussions and thank everyone for turning up. Uh, and I'm going to press pause on, I'm going to stop the recording and um, yeah, thanks very much. That was great. <laughs>